So hello to everyone. My name is Christina Hattas, and I'd like to welcome you all to this panel on decision making for a global sustainable society. I am part of the German Informatics Society team, which is supporting IFIP, the Informa International Federation for Information Processing, in organizing this series of events on the topic of the future of information processing, which is to celebrate the 60th anniversary of IFIP. Today, we have the chair of Working Group 8.3, who has organized this panel, and she will also be moderating today's event. Kara Heaven is Professor of Business Information Systems at Cork University Business School at the University College of Cork in Ireland. And already as a doctoral student back in 2007, Kira became a friend of IFIP Working Group 8.3, and now she's a chair of that working group ever since 2020. In her research, she focuses mainly on the decision support and digital transformation in healthcare. And with this, I'd like to hand over to her. Christina, many thanks and welcome this afternoon to everybody who's joined our event and a big thanks to our panelists, our academic and uh, expert practitioner panelists who've given their valuable time to come to have this most important conversation about deci decision making for a sustainable global society. Before we start the event, um, I suppose I just want to maybe uh, position the work of IFIP uh, work, working Group 8.3 in the context of the work that has been done uh, uh, with and, and in collaboration and supporting the work, work of the broader IFIP group for the last 60 years and we're really pleased to contribute to the IFIP 60 celebrations. So just to give you a little bit of history before we kick off this uh, uh, important panel session this morning, um, IFIP Working Group 8.3 Decision Support System was founded in 1981 and it brought together a multidisciplinary group for its first conference uh, entitled Processes and Tools for Decision Support at Schloss Luxembourg in Austria in July 1982. This multidisciplinary group included uh, academics from a variety of backgrounds, including IT, artificial intelligence, cognitive psychology, decision theory, organizational theory, operations research and modeling. The conference was chaired by uh, a, a long-standing member of uh, the IFIB community, uh, Henk Saul, and he suggested using simulation as a tool for decision support. Since then, there have been a number of decision support, including context-sensitive decision support systems, decision-making and decision support in the internet age, decision support in an uncertain world, creativity and innovation decision-making, and bridging the socio-technical gap in DSS, challenges for the next decade. Just to, um, I suppose, remind the community and welcome to those long-standing members of the IFIP Working Group 8.3 community, as well as the new friends who are joining us for the first time today. I just want to briefly share my screen and I suppose mention the, our upcoming conference before we proceed today. So our upcoming in-person conference so to mark the, the um, I suppose, the next international conference of the IFIP 8.3 Working Group, uh, it will take place on June 22nd. We're hoping um, for a face-to-face -face conference entitled Decision Support Systems from Data Analytics to Intuition. And we're delighted that this conference will be hosted by our colleagues and friends at Corvinus University of Budapest. So we will continue to circulate the call for papers around this event and full papers will be due on January 22nd, uh, 2022. So I'm gonna just stop, stop sharing my screen now and to uh, let's get on with proceeding, proceedings for this afternoon. So getting back to this most important event on uh, decision-making for a sustainable global society. So to celebrate 60 years of IFIP, as I've mentioned, uh, IFIP 8.3 has a long-standing history contributing to the, the broader uh, TC8 agenda. We're, I'm really pleased today to introduce our virtual panel session on decision-making for a sustainable global society. 
The objective of this session is to explore individual, organisational, governmental and societal decision making and how decisions made by stakeholders using a variety of technologies uh, contribute to glo global sustainability. Today we're joined by four experts in this area. Um, a, a mix of both practitioner and academic experts to look at key questions and we welcome we also que uh, welcome questions from from our audience as well we're going to look at key questions around sustainability use of data and technology in sustainability in terms of achieving the sustainable development goals and indeed we want to look at how we can contribute to the wider ecosystem in terms of maybe bridging the gap between academics and, and practitioners in achieving some of those goals. So without further ado, uh, I am going to introduce each of our panelists who will take approximately five minutes to um, provide us with the background and their own areas of expertise and experiences. And then we will go to a panel discussion with a range of questions. Following that, uh, we welcome and open up questions to the floor and hopefully we'll be in for some rich discussion today. So firstly, I would like to welcome uh, Xavier Dubasson. Uh, Xavier is CEO of RetroKit and he is also CEO of XE Sustainable en Energy Consulting Limited. He has over 25 years experience as an engineer in the field of sustainable energy in Ireland and internationally. Besides running a successful consultancy, he is recent founder and CEO of Retroquit, which I know he'll talk, uh, spend a little bit of time telling us about. A startup specialized in developing digital solutions to empower decision makers and doers in upscaling the decarbonization of the housing sector. So Xavier, many thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon and I will open up the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kira, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be part of a, uh, such a panel. And uh, in a way, it's quite interesting. Usually at, um, let's say, conferences or events that I, I speak to, it's usually to the converters or, you know, people from my own parish in terms of uh, the sustainable energy world. Uh, so it's great to kind of step out of that and, <clears throat> and um, let's say, immerse myself on the, you know, in the community of decision makers or <laughs> supporters of decision makers. Uh, and really, essentially, that's what uh, Retikid is about is to support the different stakeholders in um, primarily the housing sector. So most of our clients would be in social housing, uh, but increasingly in the supply chain, providing energy efficiency upgrade services for homeowners um, as well as social housing providers. And um, equally, we're using the, the power of RedKit to support policymakers in developing and implementing funding programs in, in particular in that area. Uh, maybe I think your introduction was excellent and comprehensive. Uh, just to maybe emphasize the fact that um, I am a very recent entrepreneur or startup entrepreneur uh, in that we started the, the Retrocad Adventure about two years ago uh, on the back of a, a much longer experience as a sustainable energy engineer. Uh, so I qualified in 94 uh, as a, an agricultural engineer. Pretty much straight away, I specialized in um, in renewable energy and gradually into the whole range of, let's say, techniques and technologies uh, around sustainable energy, including energy efficiency, as well as renewable energy. And I've, I come from Belgium originally, but uh, we moved to Ireland in 2001 to work with our National uh, Sustainable Energy Authority, SEI, and, <clears throat> and then uh, over the last, I guess, 15 years or a bit more, I've been working as a consulting engineer for other people or myself uh, since 2011. And Retkis came about from a, a, an idea around uh, a potential product. So we've been kind of tinkering around what we call local energy planning, uh, primarily with community organization and um, local authorities in, in looking at the energy demand within a, a region, a territory, and then helping to shape um, a roadmap for the energy transition. 
And in doing so, we, we focused on the residential sector increasingly, uh, which is a very substantial part of, let's say, the, the greenhouse gas emission jigsaw here in Ireland and I think across the globe, um, and how we needed to develop strategies to address um, uh, the requirement to decarbonize, essentially. <clears throat> and in that context, uh, about five years ago, a lot more that I became available uh, around the housing stock and how it performs from an energy efficiency point of view. And um, the idea of creating a tool that helps us analyze and then look at different uh, energy renovation scenarios uh, came about. And uh, we did two big exercises of research and development with funding from SEI, the organization I mentioned earlier, and moved from a, a very early prototype uh, with uh, Python scripts and Excel spreadsheets to a product that has become a uh, cloud-based uh, software solution, um, which essentially consists of uh, a database uh, and data management tools uh, around the energy performance data. So most European countries would have an energy performance certificate system uh, underlined by a vast quantity of data, which characterize our, every dwelling uh, pretty much at this stage in the country is characterized. <clears throat> and so we're leveraging that data to understand how the housing stock is performing currently, and then looking at different retrofit strategies to improve it to, in Ireland, the target is a B2 in terms of building energy racing um, and bring in costs and CO2 emissions, a range of KPIs into the analysis with a view to facilitate uh, decision-making and planning around big investment to upgrade the housing stock and decarbonize it. Um, and we plugged onto that a, a mapping application, which enables us to do spatial analysis and uh, what we call area-based uh, retrofit uh, planning. Just to give you a flavor, uh, this is uh, our product has been evolving quite rapidly over the last while due to more resources internally in terms of development, but also, and more importantly, a big drive by our uh, clients and stakeholders around their needs and how Reticus can be leveraged to uh, support them with, again, digital solutions. and. We've evolved from looking at a big housing stock, for example, the Cork City Council, one of our clients has got uh, 8,000 units or possibly more. Uh, and so our tool is capable of you know, managing that big data, but, but also then using the tools and the logic and the analytical uh, solutions to help individual homeowners. And, and this is a, a very recent uh, new product we've developed, which is a individual home um, energy upgrade plan, uh, which, which you know, can address individual homeowners as well as the needs of social housing providers, for example. And, and the idea is to understand what's the current situation to uh, check different solutions of energy upgrades and then provide a plan uh, you know, with a kind of a, a well-defined step process and, and using, um, let's say, uh, uh, visuals and KPIs that are relatively easy for people to understand, but also represent the, the richness of data that's available within Reticit to help decision maker. I think uh, maybe I've exceeded my five minutes already, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dave, you're absolutely spot on in terms of timing. Thank you very much. If you could maybe unshare your screen, yeah, that would yes, be great. Would do that. And so thank you for that introduction. And you provided us lots of food for thought that I'm sure people will come back to uh, as part of the, the discussion. Thank you, Xavier. Great. Uh, one second. I'm trying to see how can I unshare. That is strange. I only have the option pause share. Okay. Stop share. Great. Okay. Well done. Thank you, Xavier. <laughs> that was okay. a new one on to me. <laughs> the trickiness of Zoom. Okay, so um, many thanks to Xavier for his introduction. Next, we have um, Sarah Gowlhart, and Sarah, Sarah is Head of Climate and Environment at Energias de Portugal. Ap apologies for my poor pronunciation, Sarah. Sarah has been working on the sustainability landscape for more than 20 years. At EDP, Sarah has been responsible for sustainability strategies and corporate reporting aligned with the most recognized global standards and ESG requirements. Sarah's main responsibilities are currently at a corporate level, 
climate change, the circular economy and biodiversity programs to improve decision making processes and accelerate sustainability. Throughout her professional career, building partnerships and engaging with local communities, NGOs and, and academia, these have been the most rewarding lines of work for Sarah, who's continuously demonstrating the power of working collaboratively, collaboratively and collectively towards a common sustainability agenda. So we're most pleased to welcome Sarah this afternoon, who has a number of slides I know she, she's really keen to, to share with us. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Chiara. Thanks. Are you hearing me well? Okay, perfect. I'll try to keep on my five minutes. Thank you all for inviting EDP to be here. Uh, and I think it will be very interesting to be among such practitioners and academia around decision making for IT, which is something that I'm not used to. So I'm on a different uh, background, but here we go. So just to remind who is EDP, because it's important to say the power sector, we are based in Lisbon. Uh, this power sector, we have generation, transmission, distribution, and the supply side. And EDP just set a very important goal to become carbon neutral by 2030. We already have 74% of our installed capacity uh, are already renewable, but we want to be 100% renewable on 2030. And on 2025, we'll phase out coal. We still have some power plants, coal power plants in, in Spain and in Brazil, we are phasing them out. Uh, this is a huge challenge. It's a huge commitment for your utility, but it's very important for us to do that because the power sector, it will in fact be key to this decarbonized economy that we are looking for. So the power sector and our sector, electrification of the society is a must. If you want to keep below 1.5 in the Paris Agreement, and to, be, to, to meet this challenge, uh, the, the power sector has a very, very ambitious curve, and we aim to be part of this solution. So we, we, are, we are at the stage where climate change, everyone talks about it, but as we see from the science point of view on the right side of the graphic, we are still growing and growing even with COVID, and on the right side, we, we have a huge gap. This is not an update, it's, it's, it's a little bit better, but the gap between what is being pledged, what are the current policies and what we need to achieve is huge. So in fact, we became the power sector that used to be on, on the dark side of the, so the solution suddenly becomes on, on the big side, we will deliver we will decarbonize and we as the electricity being produced by renewables can help other sectors to decarbonize. As Javier was saying, all the building sector can, can improve a lot if electricity is building, if it comes from renewable side and, and et cetera, et cetera. The mobility space, it's key. So it has to be electrified if electricity comes from renewables. And this is where we are. And now it's not, uh, it's okay. And to understand this challenge for the, the power sector, we need to see that the electricity demand will grow three times by 2050. And we need to have 95% of renewables share in the power generation by 2050. And we can't have coal. And we still need to be clean, affordable, and reliable. This is a very, very huge. Uh, challenge that the sector is facing. And when we are talking now from sustainability stage, we, we have our commitments and we try to align them with the UN SDG agenda because it's a way that we can, it facilitates the communication between the company and society's expectations. So the SDGs agenda, what they do is they represent society's expectations. So all our commitments, we try to align them with quantitative targets and we measure our performance against those targets focusing in all these uh, SDGs. We have this internal discussion because 
sustainability is so broad, we needed to understand what will be our priority. Of course, climate is our purpose, climate, well, affordable and reliable clean energy is our purpose, but there are a lot of SDGs that we impact positively and negatively. And so this is the challenge that we are facing because we need to face the trade-offs, we need to monitor the, our commitments and commitments go well beyond environment. We are talking about safety, we are about talking about diversity, we are talking about the environmental side of it that goes beyond climate. Uh, we are go and then we are talking on the how to involve the consumer side, how can they decarbonize? And then we are talking about smart meters, 100% by 2030, or we are talking about electric uh, mobility chargers and mobility clients by 2022. And so this is a very holistic approach that we have. And for this discussion, what I think it would be important for us to have in the back of our mind, what I call the reminders for success, is that sustainability really needs to be in the beginning of a new idea. We need to have it at the first. Uh, circular economy is a very interesting concept that gives this as a, in a very transparent way. We, we can't just think about recycling. We have to think how can we design the idea first to become more sustainable. And again, as I mentioned, sustainability goes well beyond environment and climate change. Just to give you an example of our own sector, just in Portugal, where I live, 22% of people live uh, in energy poverty situation. And looking in Europe, we are talking about more than 50 million people that just don't have enough they live in poverty when talking about the access to energy. And of course, worldwide, we are talking about more than, well, around 800 million people that still has no access to, world, to, to electricity worldwide. And again, uh, trade-offs are common, but negatives need to be addressed. I thought that this was interesting to see that it is expected that by 2030, up to 20% of global electricity demand will come for information and communication technologies. Uh, and today we have around 1%. Or you know that, that it's clear that IA that has a lot of potentials, we also may be a, a way or source of inequality. We still have to address these issues as well. And finally, I just wanted to finish with something that has become really important for companies, which is the ESG investors that shaping the face of of business, meaning that we are everyone worldwide is trying to push the financial sector into sustainability business. And the question is, what does it mean? So we have to have data. We have to demonstrate what we are doing. And this is becoming really, really important. I just read this morning that the financial sector are using machine learning to pinpoint companies and to identify if they are or they are not sustainable, meaning that we need to have quantitative data and qualitative data and with quality. <laughs> Otherwise, it gives the wrong information. So more data to support sustainability is needed. And thank you. This is, <laughs> thank, thank you, Sarah. And a fantastic point to pause on for now. And one we'll be revisiting uh, during the questions, so much appreciated, fantastic. Um, our next panelist is Professor Patrick Humphreys. Um, Professor Patrick Humphreys is Emeritus Professor of so uh, Social Psychology at London School of Economics. Uh, Patrick is a past chair of I IFIP 8.3's working group. So we're delighted to welcome him this morning. He also holds the International Federation for Information Processing Silver Core Award. He is a consultant advisor at the World Reserve Trust and development director at Real Time. He led the London School of Economics RTD team on a number of grants, um, and I'm sure he'll mention those uh, and, and projects. I, I'm sure he'll mention those uh, in his presentation this morning and during the, the conversation as well. Patrick has been involved in initiatives on organizational transformation, 
entrepreneurial innovation clustering and community development and small business sector development in many countries. So we're delighted to welcome Patrick this morning and I'm hoping your sound works, Patrick, because I know we had a few problems when we did a test run. Can you hear me? We can indeed. Oh, I'm back. I changed my computer. So, so um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, you started giving an introduction, so I've done all sorts of things over my career. And I, if I told you that story, everybody would be very bored. It would take more than five minutes. But um, I just want to pick out one or two of the things, really from my life experience, what I've been doing, which I think are really important now. And perhaps think of some of the things that Sarah's been saying to take sustainability into the decision support agenda as well. And, um, and we started at Brunel University in the, in, in the mid 1970s when we formed with Larry Phillips um, the decision analysis unit, which was quite unique at that time because Larry came from the States, from Michigan. He worked for Decisions and Designs in Washington. And they were the first people who did decision conferencing, where they brought the people together who actually had to make the decisions. And uh, we used group techniques around a table. And, uh, but we also um, used computer support. But in the early days of that sort of groups and support, everybody, sat around the table with their own uh, PC in front of them and they tried to compete for the screen and it didn't work at all. So we had a, we want to use group techniques and we said, you, you're not allowed to bring anything in to the, to show. I'm, and I'm not going to show many things today. And um, one of the important things was to get people to, to first of all, find out what they had to make a decision about. Uh, what was involved, who was involved, um, and explore, perhaps explore a bit of the reality of it. And uh, then finally, and after two days, to commit to doing something. The techniques of supporting them really helped them. We had real-time techniques, um, still use them for building the model. It has to be in a language that they understand so fairly simple in terms of criteria and so on, but in their own words. So I, I'm sharing it. And um, so this first decision support we got, I got involved in was building systems supporting that, including one called MOD, multi tribute utility decomposition, which is still in use after 40 years in the nuclear industry for assessing um, whether operators can handle emergency situations, basically, and things like that. So um, we discovered it was very important to build systems that really help people. What it meant to help people was quite complicated. And um, we, as far as I was concerned, in decision making, you had two issues of decision support. You had the system which supports you because it's prize information. And then firstly, it is your assistant. It gives you the information when you want it and so on. And then you have the consultant who works with you. So another part of the system is very, very important for the interaction dialogue is how in making my decision is I actually going to support from making the decision, not just get information which is useful. And uh, we, we transferred to LSE after a few years, 1982, and became, because LSE felt they like a unit. We actually worked in the real world, which is very nice, so they brought us in. And um, then um, we, we did, I suppose, what studying case studies. We, we, we have over 450 cases of decision conferences studied from large firms like Pricewaterhouse, Heinz, and IBM and so on, to very small firms and uh, trying to understand how the process worked. And in doing that, I became more and more interesting in creative, innovative small businesses did interesting things. And um, at the same time, um, what I discovered, sometimes <laughs> I should have thought about it before, was that even if we we're working in decision conferencing, and even though we go out and get information beforehand, you do need to 
set, put all that decision making in the wider context of what's going on. So I found the organizational search group at LSE to do that and to explore uh, other places. And uh, more and more, it became very, I got interested in innovative, creative decision making that would be sustainable and how to support that in all ways. We got in 2009, you mentioned the CADIC project, which is very interesting because it was first at the time directly after the 2009 crash, where the EU's reconstruction strategy, they discovered that none of the research in the citizen support area could they use. And um, because it was top down, because their own fault was top down, because they insisted you, uh, you design projects like that. So we said to them, let us do a bottom up project. And so we go to organizations and find out what they can do, not sell them something, see if they like it, but find out what they can do and how it works. And uh, I became a great fan of the bottom up. I became a great fan of work systems that could be uh, generative. And um, I taught organizational social decision making. Uh, to students from all over the world, because we sort of have a wonderful network of students all over the world. We're not students anymore, but now collaborators. And so I'd be able to work actually with building uh, individual companies, but particularly clusters, entrepreneurial innovation clusters worldwide. <laughs> the, uh, and, that, and now, right now, in post COVID, and I have quite a lot of experience in different sectors, but what interests me really more is, um, well, partly the problem of the top down and the problem of the financial sector um, in doing this, because this has been very important in sustaining uh, the decision support um, area as it's been working, and yet almost certainly post COVID and post the changes which are going to happen, is not going to work in the future. One of the things we have to face is that we have normally, I mean, not only academics, but also people doing it uh, for, for practitioners, uh, use top-down support. And uh, that's, most of that's going to vanish. So how do people do make things sustainably and uh, build bottom-up themselves? And how is that going to work in the future? And also, the other main issue is in decision making, decision support systems generally prioritize the individual decision maker who has to handle making the decision top down, and it's very difficult. And in complex situations, they're left in a sea of uncertainty to what to do. So what I want to do is uh, talk, is explore what I'm doing is how you work with bottom up with doing all this. And in that socializing decision enactment, once you decide you want to make a decision, support it. It's very nice if it can be socialized and actually creatively done by all sorts of people rather than yourself using their perspectives and your perspectives. And so you're multi sided. And that's what I'm working on now. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. And you've, you're after raising some questions that we will consider a little in a little bit more detail um, during our kind of further discussion. So much appreciated, Patrick. And last but certainly not by no means least, um, I want to introduce our final panelist today. And it's with great pleasure I introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Karen Neville, who is Senior Lecturer in Business Information Systems at Cork University Business School here at University College Cork. Karen is the Founder and Managing Director of UCC Centre for Re Resilience and business continuity and has generated over 14 million euro in income for UCC. Karen is an expert in decision support systems and approaches to emergency management and business continuity. She has formed and led international consortia in the air in the in uh, and is active in Horizon Europe research developing technology readiness level solutions uh, which have changed regional and national policies. So welcome this afternoon, Karen, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, thanks, Karen. I think you said most of my, um, went through most of my background there. Um, so I'm really delighted um, to talk to you today. Um, I'm 
as Kira said, I founded and I managed the Centre for Resilience and Business Continuity, and we do research in looking at disaster management and the different tools, techniques, and decision support um, in terms of how to not only um, how to provide decision support tools to um, different stakeholders, but also in terms of even decision making under stress. So. Um, disasters that can be natural they're man-made um i think i don't have trouble that much unfortunately have trouble explaining my research to people anymore um they're not from emergency management since COVID 19 and people can see the impact the ramifications for the individual um, cities globally um a bit of um of an emergency so we um this, my center and um, designs and we develop decision support systems for primarily emergency management agencies but also um, businesses um, in terms of um, managing for um, business continuity and um, so emergency management we're talking about tools in terms of preparing for a disaster and responding to it and recovering from it and a big thing now for uh, since COVID-19 um, is that organized there's a huge increase, a surge in um, tools that help um, companies and cities and local authorities better prepare and respond um, to disruptions, be they be a pandemic or a cyber attack, um, an explosion, any type of disaster. And with emergency management, you're talking about um, being better prepared, being more resilient, no matter the, these type of things, these disruptions are going to happen. So um, whether it's a cyber attack, um, so how do you reduce the impact of um, that attack? How, how are you better prepared? Whether it's training, preparing all your staff, um, whether it's the tools to give you a proper look and know what, the, what is happening in your organization in terms of the situation. You know, knowing the types, what, what, what intelligence do you have about your business? With the cybersecurity, what are the external threats that you could be expecting? Can you see what's happening? Are you able to detect a cyber attack? And um, if it has happened, how are you going to respond? The next time learning from it, you know, how do you better prepare for the, the next cyber attack? So our tools look for a business typically would be about um, cyber attacks for cities, for countries, cross-border events, whether a flawed pandemic. So better preparing and making societies um, like the European Union um, issue a lot of calls around being, how to make the European Union more resilient against whether climate change, whether it's a pandemic and uh, cyber attacks. So we focus a lot on that situation awareness knowing what the situation is for your business, knowing what it is for the city, okay, building that knowledge, knowing what's happening. And uh, my colleagues are talking about kind of knowing again whether it's for a particular business, whether it's in terms of improving that business, making you better prepared in, around um, sustainability. So knowing and understanding it, and that's very difficult. Um, we do an awful lot in terms of also uh, resilience education and training awareness. So what kind of education is needed, how to train practitioners um, in making better decisions and also reminding people, you know, making people aware of, of the issues, making them know, aware of what they have to do personally um, as groups and um, looking after one another in communities and making sure everyone, you, you're strong, whether you're, you're a company or whether you're um, a city as your weakest link and kind of that building that resilience for a city. Um, so in terms of, um, that, that's primarily my research in, in building a decision support tools around emergency management and business continuity. In, in terms of Cork University Business School, that is our, our sustainability for business for our students um, it is our, our, our strategy um, for um, the next um, well our strategy at the moment for the next seven years um, and beyond but we're looking at how we can align ourselves and develop the SDGs and uh, for research for our students and one of the key initiatives that we've undertaken um, is called PRIME, so uh, Principles for Responsible Management and Education. So principles around looking at how we can improve our courses and uh, for developing those sustainability skills that our students will require. How can we collaborate better with 
and support businesses in terms of sustainability research. And we joined um, Prime as a global business network and to see how we can better collaborate globally with other business schools, learn from them. And that's what we're doing at the moment, mapping how what research we're doing and how and look at the gaps of where what more we can do in terms of the SDGs. So um, that's really at the, at the moment in terms of my own research, where I am in, in looking at how we can be more resilient businesses, particularly, particularly resilient to um, any kind of event and, sustain, and more sustainable. Thanks, Kara. Thanks, Karen. And it's it's really interesting to hear about uh, the work of the business school as well. I suppose we've we've heard from our panelists at this stage um, from a variety of perspectives and, and experiences. But one thing that came to, to light on Friday when, we're, when we were preparing our discussions for this event was, well, what, what do we mean when we talk about sustainability? What do we mean? Are we all using common language to describe this aim of, of sustainable achieving sustainable development goals and uh, achieving that goal of sustainability. So I suppose herein lies our maybe our first question for our panelists this afternoon. And I might start with Sarah. When, when you talk about sustainability, Sarah, uh, what do you mean? And I suppose based on your experiences, what should we all be thinking about when we think about sustainability? Thanks, Kiara. It's, it's a very challenging question because I've been on, on the arena for some time now. And, the, um, and in fact, everyone and every each of one of us just scopes it into what we are able to, to, to understand or to manage. And I think this is a problem of managing this word. And the, the scope of it changes a lot. Even internally, when we are talking about, in the last three years, give you an example, we have three different definitions, or not three different definitions, we just have one, but people understanding it in a different way or, or slightly different, although we are all aim the same. I think I'm positive that we are all looking for the same. Nevertheless, uh, when uh, someone talked about, oh, the professor, talked about, uh, Patrick, about the top-down decision support or bottom-up, this is one of the decisions. When we are talking about a company level, we are looking about the sustainability of the business in the long term. So there's a time horizon that we have to consider and decisions in the short term and in the long term from the sustainability perspective are different and they compete with each other several times. So you have the strategy when you're talking about sustainability, and it's just what I mentioned, global climate, global challenges and global goals that we need to address. But then you can be yourself. So all employees inside my company, they want to behave more sustainably. And this is a little bit different. So you're talking by yourself. What is your role? What can you do? And then uh, you are looking about your daily day today and you may be talking about uh, well-being and, and health and recycling, but you're not talking about energy poverty, for example. It doesn't, it's not in your mind. And then we have now this new layer of investor communities. And for investors, they are very, very pragmatic and they have to just pick up this word and cut it in slices. And this is where ESG came in, environment and society and governance. And we keep on trying to and struggling what is exact environment, what is exact society, what is the governance bit of the strategy. So all the governance side, it's something that it's very linked to the company. So how do we organize internally to deliver what is sustainable, but it's, it's considered by the investor community as a, an important uh, action that the companies have to have. So, you know, we have to cover the both all of these uh, different concepts and try to align them. And this is where data comes in. So what we are facing now is a, a huge need of data, then you then can link to the SDGs or not, but you can monitor and have track on it. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Do any of our other our panelists want to come in on just in terms of defining sustainability? We're getting a number of questions particularly to particular panelists, but does anyone else want to comment on the definition of sustainability? 
So what we mean by sustainable. Patrick? Yeah, I'd just like to build on what Sarah said a little bit. <clears throat> that when you talk about also what language, what different people speak different language, but what it means for, if we brought up real sustainability and keeping the world alive, both naturally and socially and culturally, as, you know, as a place to live, we're talking about all of our activities and all of these ways of looking at sustainability. The biggest problem is, um, it's, it's very nice, Sarah said, you think sustainability, you like to do it in your own work, but in, in the business, is that going to be sustainable? And in what way is it going to be sustainable? I mean, sustainability in terms of making lots of profit may also be making a lot of exploitation and problems elsewhere and so on. So um, what I think we have to think about is in sustainability is the complete agenda, all of it, because otherwise you just do a part and you discover that the part which you can do, you're not very empowered in. You do very well and you feel very good, but there's still sustainability isn't working. So, and uh, with regard to uh, the financial sector and the desire for sustainability investors, they do have a problem because um, they still want to make money out of investing in companies. And so they want to suggest in their terms whether it's sustainable for long enough to make money, um, which may not, um, they may miss entirely in that, in the way they often do, which they evaluate the companies like, no, I've watched this, um, and what they ought to be thinking about. Because um, I've always worked on systems which are investor proof and politician proof. They welcome us to do it, but, we but it's very dangerous to be dependent upon them, particularly investors and effectively taking money out of where it is really needed in building what you need to make sustainability innovatively and creatively. And as you said, in making thinking of businesses, how they're sustainable, you need to do it all the way through at the beginning. I really agree with that all the time. And um, one thing I think is, is very important is that many people who want sustainability don't find they can do it in practice. Um, individually they can, organizationally it becomes very different because of problems top down, bottom up, problems how you develop and so on. Um, if I can share a screen for a second. Um, yeah, you see. should be able to share your screen, Patrick. Um, let's see. Um, there we go. Yes. Um, what we've been working on recently um, was I've taken a long, quite a big analysis, working out, going right the way through history, starting with one of the most successful and sustainable systems, which lasted a thousand years, which of course was a silk road trading entrepreneurial system, to work out um, some of the things you need if working bottom up, I mentioned earlier on, um, we are probably going to be in a situation in which we get less top-down help, whether it's from people with good or bad motivation and so on, um, it, it, because of the, the problems of, of the international systems. So um, the, if people are going to work, work for themselves, um, this, this is some things which you needed. Individual people increasingly, um, or groups locally, need to get their thing increasingly a part of the global economy, especially much more since lockdown and the, and the growth of platforms. So, but you need a trustworthy trading system for both private and public goods, together with safe, secure transportation routes and payment systems transacting goods, because this gives you a freedom of space, both locally and internationally, to make the possibility of exchange and increase in value through what you make creatively and so on. Also, the need for some, uh, I'm very much against uh, cryptocurrency because of the secrecy. Um, we work with blockchain, but we particularly um, work with the idea of it enables complete transparency and trust. And also this makes it easier 
for people to explore the provenance of what is happening, what people are offering, because often you don't know them. You have to go and find out. And uh, by provenance, where it came from, how it was made, and let people tell you themselves, let them demonstrate it. And this is also innovation promotion. So it's very important you get these sort of channels or people just don't know what's going on. Um, Patrick, and also, thank you for thank you for sharing that, Patrick. We're, we're beginning to get a number of okay. questions coming through the chat. So I, I suppose it would be great if you could maybe make your final point around the slide. Yeah, I will. And also what, what I said, you, you need to work with clusters together, so board you as a local and and, uh, and you also need people come and see you. You, you need, um, and this is sustainable. There is a very, I went, so Destinet has a very interesting um, take on, on sustainable tourism, which actually involves transacting, the importance of transacting with the local people as well. And those I've found are uh, some of the enduring success factors. If you get all these available, sustainability is much, much easier than what you're doing. That's it. You, you presented dilemmas, and I think it, it really echoes with a number of the points that Sarah, Sarah has made, Patrick. Many thanks. If you wouldn't mind on sharing your slide there, that would be great. I'm trying to, yeah, I'd like to. <laughs> I wonder, I, I see another, a couple of questions coming up in the chat that are relating to data and IT and particularly the use of information technology to, su to support sustainability in terms of smaller businesses. Xavier, I wonder, do you have um, some comments given your, the expertise, your expertise um, over a number of years, just in terms of working with uh, different types of businesses, including public services and the use of data and technology to mm. support sustainability? Yes, well, maybe I can describe our own journey as an SME in that regard. So, you know, for a very long time, I've been working on my own. <laughs> uh, you know, we're as a consultancy, we're a very small business and uh, we have um, a network of um, associates or freelancers that we work with to bring in different expertise or capabilities, etc. But essentially, uh, I'm the guardian of my own knowledge, put it that way, <clears throat> and that I have found uh, not only uh, boring, <laughs> but also not very productive in that, you know, like my time and is very limited. And, and what I found very transformative is, as a business owner is, is the, first of all, the creation of a team with innovation at the core of it, and creativity has been mentioned several times by Patrick, and that's really been part of our journey. And and then the essentially, you know, the ability to translate and create a tool out of our collective knowledge, uh, which resides in our brain, obviously, <laughs> it doesn't come from nowhere, it's built on research and learning from other people, etc. But we wanted to create a tool that other people could use themselves uh, to make decision around investing in energy or grade for their homes or their housing stock or their, you know, their businesses, etc. And for us, the, the translation of that knowledge uh, from spreadsheets that were our own property, put it that way, into a system that others can use to make their analysis and then their decision on that basis has been very much at the core of what you know we've been doing for the last three years. And <clears throat> what we'd like to do is maybe liberate others from the constraints of, let's say, their state of knowledge around a specific topic, which in our case is, is quite, you know, specific around energy efficiency and energy, renewable energy in, in, in buildings and homes in particular, to, to be able to, you know, much quicker get to the point where they can decide to invest in a specific uh, project, uh, technology, etc., cetera, and, uh, and let them get on with their you know, the, the realizing that and, and remove, let's say, or at least lessen very much the burden of analysis and the cost that typically comes with that um, in, in normal situations. So just, the other, just, sorry, yeah. So just to follow up, there's a question in the chat from our colleagues and IFIP 8.3 uh, officer, Gloria Wren, just around how receptive are people to energy audits and how do you help people understand the importance of managing energy? So specifically about your presentation. 
Um, well, generally speaking, well, it, when it comes to housing energy performance certificate, the BER system as we have it here, that's mandated by uh, law and regulations and, and is also at the core of a lot of um, funding programs and, and their implementation. So <laughs> in many cases, people don't really have a choice to have it done for their home. Um, but where it becomes more intimate and something that they put value on is, well, if, if they're selling their property, having a, a good BER racing really helps, you know, increasing the value of the dwelling. Uh, but also um, when they're looking at how can I make my home more comfortable and reduce my energy bills, et cetera, the data that's available in that is very important. And from an energy point of view, audit point of view, that's what enables the creation of that data set that we can then bring in the analysis. and. I think, generally speaking, people are, are quite receptive to it. So I haven't heard situations where people uh, would be feeling threatened by it. So, or, you know, as long as they understand what's the value of the information and how they can themselves use that. And um, that's something that's evolving currently, you know, where there's a lot more solutions such as Retkis to, to help them as a homeowner to understand the current situation, to see how they can improve. Uh, and that's becoming part of the system a lot more than it used to. So I think people can definitely see a lot more value in, in that information and the audit that enables this. Uh, sorry, the second part of the question was... So the second question was about help, supporting people to understand... How to um, manage energy. Yeah, yeah, the importance of managing energy, yeah. Uh, for us, the key issue, if you want, is to to convince people about the benefits uh, of managing energy, what it means for them, and, and first of all, maybe to understand where is the problem. Uh, and um, energy poverty has been mentioned before, and that's uh, you know currently it's a big issue. You know we're going to see this winter people really struggling with paying for their electricity bills and their gas bills, etc. Um, and to be able to give people, you know, let's say ways to understand how much they're using, how much is costing them, and if they did something such as energy upgrade, what it would result in terms of reducing their energy costs. And then there's a multitude of other benefits that we're trying to quantify and then bring into the decision making uh, uh, around comfort, for example, around the value of your home, around the resilience of the home. Um, so there's a range of KPIs that we're bringing forward in our reports, in our interfaces to help people understand uh, what the impact would be and therefore you know, being more proactive in terms of managing their energy use. In a way, we're looking more at an investment piece. So it's not the day-to-day -day management uh, of energy. That maybe is a different solution. It, it would be interesting to bring that into our system where we're looking, okay, you know, you need to, you're need you in a kind of G racing currently, you need to be a 2 B2, that's what you need to do. We, we kind of covered that fairly well. But then how do you manage your energy after that? Um, you know, or improve, or if you're not capable of investing, these are a number of things you can do in, in your current use of energy to lessen the burden from a cost point of view, but also from an environmental point of view. Thank you, Xavier. I'm, I'm going to move to Karen, actually, and just building on that. So uh, Fergal has commented that there seems to be a potential parallel across resilience, sustainability and bottom up decision making. Uh, Karen, I suppose, just thinking about the, the work that you've done um, in terms of uh, developing resilient systems, would you like to maybe comment and, and, and add some kind of further um, information and detail around using and leveraging innovative technology to to build that resilience and and how it supports uh, decision making um yeah it, uh, well part of question was bringing in carbon um levels i think um i'm carbon uh, yeah, i just i just cho chose because, a little yeah. part of <laughs> no, that no, it's, it's not yeah. specifically the question i'm asking isn't yeah. specific to energy and carbon no no thank you um so Yes, so in terms of building resilience um, I, with uh, using decision-making tools, I, I just want to actually bring in a, a comment um, to think in with what was said earlier as well, and I, I think it's come up. Um, it just made me, in, in terms of decision support tools and advances and using artificial intelligence, a big thing 
like I, I, I'm talking, my research would be resilience where the environmental change has led to an impact like the flood or an earthquake. And um, there are different projects that we're looking at and talking with cities and, and collaborating and sharing lessons learned. But a big thing is actually um, allowing different communities the practices, whether they're agencies um, like police, army, um, ambulance, health and um, businesses coming together when they normally wouldn't be and using decision support tools to respond, respond to that event. So, and also as well in terms of cybersecurity attacks, using artificial intelligence for comp between companies, cross sectors, to share that um, cyber threat intelligence to become more resilient against cyber attacks. So a big kind of change is using decisions in terms of my own research is kind of using decision support systems in terms of collaborating and um, allowing those systems that the different agencies or businesses will use themselves and to integrate them and to be able to coordinate and collaborate and build up pitch, the picture of the situation and to be able to allocate resources and share information to better respond to the event, whether it's a flood or, or a pandemic or a cyber attack. Um, I thought that that would be kind of um, something in terms of businesses for others in terms of how, how they would use um, decision support systems for that collaboration. Because it's a, it's a big thing for cities and for countries for how to do that, how to collaborate and how to coordinate. And I was just wondering what the other panelists thought of that and how maybe that would impact their own work. Thank you, Karen. Does, it, does anyone want to respond to Karen? Sarah, do you, do you want to make a response to Karen? I, I was struggling somehow to, to understand all, all, what Karen was oh, sorry, saying. Kristen. Okay, so I was just saying in terms of using um, decision support um, systems, and that one of the big things for resilience, whether it's um, for building resilience, whether it's for different agencies that would respond or whether it's for countries and um, sorry, companies collaborating, uh, using decision support systems to collaborate in response and to coordinate their, their response to the companies, typically a cybersecurity threat and for the countries you're talking about a flood or pandemic. Yeah, uh, well, uh, my experience is more linked to all the what we have in the critical infrastructures. Mm -hmm. So yeah, because of the networks, yeah. yeah, and definitely uh, we need to have this collaboration really strong. It's something that we've all been learning about. Uh, and when we're talking, so there are a lot of, if we are talking about the use of systems to support that, they, they start to exist, but I think they can improve significantly. What we have is to link the, 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 the way the system responds to the citizens' impacts. One thing that it's really missing, and it's being discussed uh, significantly, yeah. even under the taxonomy, the EU taxonomy on adaptation, mm. which is one way of the decision-making process is how do, you, how do you improve that system to become more resilient, physically resilient to floods, to storms, to somehow. But on the other side of the coin is how to, do you involve the local communities that will be impacted by it and this is another this is a very challenging thing so uh bringing these parts all together and find uh, a common language and then find a way that everyone is on the top of their own information about how to behave it's mm -hmm. something that we still need to work this is something that everyone is working on uh, significantly and it's becoming clear when we are talking about resilience from an operational side, is that we have to have our assets more resilient because of the business side, but we have to take always in consideration the communities, the ones that are impacted. Uh, and so yeah. this is a very important side of the story. Thank you, Sarah. Patrick, do you want to comment on that? Um, <coughs> yes, <coughs> excuse me. I, I, I think um, when we, when we've done a lot of studies about um, uh, small businesses and big ones too, and looking at sustainability, and uh, we had all sorts of, uh, where they made successful decisions, they uh, 
there are all sorts of things, criteria, I suppose, which were important, but what we found looking at them, in fact, there are only two that mattered. Um, you could, if there was an element of robustness, which is what she called resilience, so resilience, and uh, you, so you, you, you'd still be there if there's trouble, and flexibility is really important as you operate in a new way. And what I would, and uh, what I go beyond, and flexibility is very important. But the question is, if you're flexible, that's great. But who's going to do the flexing? And then that's why I, I think that for real sustainability, uh, you, you need to have the resilience, the robustness, but you need, need uh, it's very hard on your own, no matter how good you are in a large organization, to use that flexibility in the way you've thought of make it work because usually um, things that go wrong uh, in well-managed, I mean, we saw the nuclear, I've worked in the nuclear industry for 30 years. And uh, the, in the incidents now, which cause real trouble, simply ones that are not in the resilience book, not in the risk uh, analysis, because nobody thought about it. I mean, very early on, uh, there were some severe accidents because nobody had thought it was necessary to have waterproof keyboards um, for the operators because otherwise they may spill their coffee on them. And that caused enormous trouble. So you learn those things, but the, unfortunately there's always more. So it's very, very important to realize you can't, to have a way of creatively responding and using um, as many as much of the bottom up information you have between of people and you know we're socializing the, the whole system so you can cope with the unforeseen rapidly um, through literally joint creative activity and uh, <coughs> that's the other side I think to the resilient side which is being stressed in the last discussion. Thanks, Patrick. That's fantastic. I, there's a question I want to pose to all of our panelists, and it's been posed here in the Q&A chat or the chat by uh, Gloria Wren. It's decision making about sustainability comes down to a culture, cultural focus, doesn't it? So question mark. So, uh, Xavier, I can see you smiling. Uh, do you, would you like to respond to that question? Do you have some thoughts on that? <laughs> Nothing to uh, elaborate, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, well, as an engineer, we definitely look at things with uh, technical lenses, and, and I've learned to put euros uh, numbers against, the, you know, the technical solution and, and broaden up the, the, the scope of the analysis from that point of view. But um, there is a very significant element of, you know, culture and behavior that has a big impact on how we do things from a sustainable energy point of view in the housing and, you know, in, in what we're doing or, or what's our kind of focus. And I, what I found really interesting is the, the, the bottom-up uh, discussion in, in this panel, right, and how that's important for decision-making. And culturally, we're not used to that, that's for sure, like as an engineer, you know, and most of our clients find that very challenging Sarah you've mentioned this uh, <clears throat> and so in the way we design systems we need to change our let's say our approach um, and use different tools uh, for for designing solutions uh, but also to understand that from our point of view ultimately what we're impacting or who we're impacting with our the proposed solutions and systems is homeowners or let's say um, people living in homes and you know they're they're much broader group of people uh, so it's difficult to really be able to listen learn and exchange with such a large number of people and it there i guess there is a certain fear in in how are we going to manage those conversations? You know, where is that going to lead us to? And, and our system currently is very kind of dry from that point of view, and, and that's something we need to change. And part of it, I think, would be around the kind of data we use for analysis and, and decision-making support, uh, but also around communication and engagement. Um, and I think we're, it's, we're very much at the beginning of the journey in that regard. 
Thank you, Xavier. Uh, anyone else want to comment on ch changing culture? Sarah? Yeah. Yes, I, I like the question. It's because I was struggling here. It's a cultural, it, it, it needs to be a value. It needs to be a value. It needs to be completely internalized in our daily lives. And it's, it's really hard. I can see with my children, we all, they, they grew up uh, knowing how to recycle and where to recycle. And even then they still miss up sometimes. So we all need to be really, you know, it, it needs to be a value and it needs to be completely internalized. Otherwise, uh, it, it becomes really, really difficult from an individual perspective to have a sustainable behavior all the time. It's really difficult. I'm, I'm conscious of time. I have one further question and I'm, I'd uh, opened it up to the entire panel and, and it's following the discussion we had on Friday when we met. Um, how do we measure success in terms of sustainability? Would, would we need data. Like to, we, would each of you maybe very quickly comment on that before we, clo we, we go to our closing remarks? So Sarah, please start. We need data. We really need data. I think we are still talking about, but we need to translate what we talk about into data. Find where we are impacting the opportunities, the downsides of it, and then quantify it. And bottom up, we will have at a company level, for instance, I will have information for supporting decision making. Otherwise, I feel that everyone talks about it, but I don't have the data with me. I need them. Thank you, Sarah. Karen, can I move to you? Um, I well, in terms, of, I agree with Sarah in terms of we need the data and um, we need to be able to be better at collaborating and coordinating our resources and working together. Um, that's, that's what I, I, and having the right tools to help us make, to support those decisions. Thank you, Karen. Patrick. Yeah, <laughs> I think having data is really important, <clears throat> but you need to know why you want the data as well. They, they are, I also say in big data and so on, data mining techniques are often so important so you can get very complex data in the right form so people can use it. <coughs> and, um, but then the, 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 the question is, um, how might you use it for what? Um, you can use it for analyzing what other people do, but you probably have not so much power on that. But what I'm very interested in how people use it as information about things they could do, which then would be in their businesses, which then would be uh, would be quite interesting. So you see where you, you can study the parameters very well. Um, by the way, the parameters, not only what you could do, but people also uh, forget the big, the big data. If you look at it a little more laterally and what you look at, can tell you how you're gonna trip up through your fantasy. Mm. It's really important to look at not what Big George says you can't do, but if you try doing this, which also you have to think about. Mm. And, um, uh, and again, if we, uh, in New Haven, for example, we had quite a, a, a lot of um, interest in, in recycling, but the, the, where this town in which I live, but there are a lot of makers in this town and so people got far more interested when they think they have, how they might repurpose the material, not only recycle it, but make something which, which is interesting. So um, you, you've, you, you've got a big problem if things end up like plastic in the oceans, it, it's just there, you can't do anything with it. But on, on the process of, of going right the way through the process, the more people can intervene with that, and uh, use the material they have again to recycle and make something useful which is not harmful um, the better so again um, I, I think big data is very interesting but looking uh, with a sideways view with a wider view about how you might use this creatively and how you might have some sustainable for you and also for everybody else through that is very, very important for how we use Big Data in, um, in decision support. Thank you, Patrick. Really wise words there. Xavier, we'll leave the last word to you. Not much to add to that. <laughs> Maybe just to <laughs> no pressure. You know, no, but, you know, just listening to the, the other panelists and understanding how it applies to us. And 
uh, when I was jotting ideas in answer to your kind of questions uh, earlier, you know, one thing that was clear is that we need to diversify the, the nature of the data that we're using. And Sarah has said that. Um, and, you know, a key example for me is we're promoting more insulation materials to be applied to homes, et cetera, but uh, currently we don't really factor in what's the embodied energy. Most of them are manufactured using oil or natural gas, fossil fuels, generally speaking. They have an embodied carbon content. And are we aggravating the problem? Uh, you know, okay, we're reducing energy use in homes by insulating them, but, you know, equally, you know, we need an energy of energy to to uh, produce the materials, to transport them, and to apply them, etc. And then, you know, there's a waste problem associated with that. So, having more of a life cycle analysis of the kind of solutions we propose, and uh, that is broader than just from an energy point of view, is is going to be much more important. And also, looking at a, a forty years lifespan of again the, the systems we're proposing is is you know predicting what the future will be like is is going to be is is a big big challenge uh, in in now deciding how we're going to resolve the the climate crisis and and we need to do that within the next 30 years and so we we like we can't make wrong decisions at this stage and i think that's really challenging and scary it's it's cr absolutely critical. Um, one of our IFIB 8.3 members, Peter Keenan, has suggested we go back to insulation with straw. So that yeah. that's I actually you know, agree. Yeah, no, it's a very valid point. So th thank you, Xavier. On that note, I'm conscious that we're over time. Um, uh, our conversation has been wide and varied this morning, this afternoon. Uh, I'm conscious we've touched on but a couple of the SDGs. We would be here for another. 12 hours discussing the others. Um, this has maybe given a lot of food for thought to the IFIP 8.3 working group uh, and beyond in terms of considering the data, the technology, the process, and not least the people involved in pursuing sustainability and achieving the SDGs. Thanks to our panelists, uh, Sarah Goulhart, uh, Dr. Karen Neville, Professor Patrick Humphreys, and Mr. Xavier Dubasong for their time and their energy and their expertise. Um, thank you all for, to, for your contribution to this fantastic panel. Um, I look forward to seeing as many of you as in person as possible. Uh, in Budapest in June, Siri is talking to me here. Um, in Budapest in June uh, 2020, we look forward to a face-to-face -face engagement and to seeing uh, our IFIP members and, and new friends. So please join uh, our conference in, in June 2022. And, uh, uh, it's for me to say thank you to Christina and all of the team at, uh, who've been organising the IFIP 60 anniversary events. Uh, thanks to you all and take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very also, much. On behalf of the German Informatics Society, on behalf of thank IFIP, you. thank you to our attendees, of course, for being here. Thank you to our panellists and thank you, Kira, for organising this event. It's been very interesting. You will all be able to find a recording of this session as well as of all the previous and upcoming panels on the IFIP Jubilee website. So if you go to ifip.org slash jubilee60, you can find information about all the past and also all of the five remaining upcoming panels on the future of information processing. So thank you, everybody, and have a good rest of your day. <laughs>